Do you remember all the original craziness around GameStop, the original meme stock out there, uh, and all the excitement that was around that? And it seemed like there was this odd group of people on Reddit, on a subreddit called Wall Street Bets, taking on big money, taking on Wall Street, taking on big hedge funds in particular, and winning. And we're going to talk about that today, and we're going to do that by reviewing, uh, I'm going to do a book review around a great book um, called The Antisocial Network. It's by uh, Ben Mesrick, and it's uh, The Antisocial Network, The GameStop Short Squeeze, and the Ragtag Group of Amateur Traders That Brought Wall Street to Its Knees. And it's a very good book, and so we're going to review this book and tell a little bit of the story through that, and then we're at the end, stick around the end, because we're going to talk about, can it happen again, and is there ways to use this for our own investing now, uh, now that we're, you know, past the time of the original time of GameStop. So all that is coming up. Hey there, and welcome to the channel where we help you to learn fast so you can become confident and a successful investor. If that types of videos sound interesting to you, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Okay, so let's talk about the book, The Antisocial Network by Ben Mesrek. And um, I bought it on the first day it became available to the general public on September 7th. And I read through it, and I wanted to be a little bit more critical of it and all that. I'll tell you what, I read through it in one day. I read a lot. I don't usually complete and read a whole book in one day. So uh, it's a very, very good book. And the reason I think I liked this book was it's not only for weirdo, geeky investment guys like me, uh, but it's actually told in a very narrative style with a lot of character development, actually, for a nonfiction book. So if you don't want to, and it doesn't get much into the whole technical detail and jargon and all that, you can enjoy the story, which is a real David versus Goliath story. Regular people, retail investors versus big money, the smart money, the hedge funds. And it talks about that story and all the kind of weirdness that got around that and also some of the challenges within our whole, our whole system. So it really you know, talks to things through in a manner where you're, you're seeing conversations with people, people working with their, talking with their friends, their family, uh, behind the scenes stuff of some of these big money uh, firms and all that. And you get some real perspective on that from an individual standpoint and really told in more of a story format as it walks through with what happened there uh, during that time period. And you got some real key players in the book. You've got the hedge fund managers, right? Uh, really represented by a company called Melvin Capital, right? The smart, the smartest of the smart money, basically, Melvin Capital. So they're they're the Goliath, right? They're the the big strong, hey, you know, we're the smart money, you know, we're the winners here on Wall Street. So that's the Goliath. And then you have uh, David, right? The Goliath story, right? So you've got retail investors, regular people like you and me. Uh, a, a lot of them are, of course, getting together. And this is where the social part of it comes through. through a social networking through a forum site called, of course, Reddit. And there's a subreddit called Wall Street Bets. And they share different Wall Street tips. And GameStop was really promoted and led early on uh, by a person named Keith. <laughs> what you would know him probably more famously now as Roaring Kitty. Right, so we got the smart money of Melvin Capital versus Roaring Kitty and the gang of people, right, on on uh, on Reddit, right, and it talks about that story and it brings in some other people to represent different parts of that story. You've got a, a college student who didn't buy books, instead bought GameStop. You have a nurse who's a single mom who gets caught up in the excitement, and decides to invest, and uh, you know, and you got a woman who is uh, so consumed by GameStop that even if she's getting her ultrasound, because <laughs> she's pregnant and getting her ultrasound to see the first pictures of her unborn child, she's thinking about what's going on with GameStop, because she's right in the middle of that, fear, of, that, of that flurry of excitement that's going on. And so there's this whole narrative discussion around this roller coaster of emotions of all these different characters, from the concern and chagrin of the, of the big money Wall Street folks to the excitement and risks and, and concerns around, uh, around the regular people. And they go through all these roller coaster of emotions, whether it's FOMO, fear of missing out. Maybe there's a little bit of greed. And a lot of time, it's just, you know, a, a lot of it's about the fight for regular people against Wall Street, right? There's a, certainly a narrative and a theme around that where a lot of folks invested in GameStop and didn't even care what went up. They just liked the fact that they were kind of sticking it to hedge funds. They were sticking it to that big money, that supposed smart money in Wall Street. And you have that theme uh, goes through there too. And so those are the main players in it, but I also think there's a, a another player in there you have hedge fund managers you have retail investors but then there's this whole third player in there 
that's kind of the system, right? It's the process, it's the system. And that's represented by folks like brokerage houses, in particular, really the main player in all this from a brokerage house standpoint, our online broker is Robinhood, right? We can do free trades, but are they really free? And how is this kind of all tied into the system and the problems that came up later that we're gonna talk about? So you've got Robinhood, you got this kind of this murky company, you know, it's kind of portrayed as a real bad guy, which is Citadel Capital, which is kind of makes all the money flow around, right? They're the ones that when you buy some stock, it goes to Robin and goes to places like Citadel Capital that makes it all kind of happen. In the end, you get your stock. But that middleman of Citadel Capital is, you know, somebody like the behind the scenes uh, pulling the levers, right? Who is the real power here? And maybe who's the real bad guy? It might be Citadel Capital. So it's a very good book from that narrative standpoint. Also, as I mentioned, it doesn't get bogged down in jargon. Right, so you know, I, I can do some jargon. I, I like investing and all that, so I can do some I can do some jargon <laughs> a little bit. But you know, for folks like my wife, the lovely Mrs. B, bored by investing. I know it's shocking. How can she be bored by investing? But she can enjoy this book because of that narrative style and because it's more of a a purse about people with a little bit of the um, you know investing behind it too, a little bit of that uh, behind it. But one thing to get you know that does explain very well, really in about one paragraph, is understanding this concept of the short squeeze. And you're like, well, what's that? You know. So just a moment on that, because that's kind of the, what made this all kind of possible, is basically, and I'm going to be real brief on this, is shorting is you're basically betting that a stock is going to go down. Usually folks buy a stock because the idea we want to buy low and sell high. We want the stocks to go up. But sophisticated investors can do what's called shorting, shorting stocks. And so like hedge funds, a lot of times will short stocks. And what that means is it's the opposite. They're going to bet that the stock is going to go down. They would look at a stock like, and did, at a stock like GameStop and say, boy, you know, video game sales are going through the roof, especially if this is all happening during the early days of the COVID pandemic. But while everybody's buying their, in, their, um, their games online or streaming their games online, GameStop's like this old school retailer with these outlet mall locations. And oh, by the way, we're in COVID-19 lockdown pandemic. You couldn't go to the mall. And they've been really struggling before that. And now they're going to struggle more. So they're betting, the hedge funds are betting that that uh, that the GameStop's going to do even worse. And so we're going to short that stock, betting that it's going to go down. Now, there's a big risk with shorting stocks because you can lose money if the stock price goes up. You have to have that stock price goes down. If you're shorting a stock, and the price goes up, you can lose a lot of money. In fact, you can lose an unlimited amount of money, more than your initial investment. And there's a time limit around it too. You have to, because you're, it's a real technical thing of sort of borrowing shares and all this kind of stuff. But the main thing to take away from this is you can lose a lot of money and you have to basically conclude that transaction and take your losses if the price goes up. There's a certain time limit where that has to happen. If it doesn't, you can do what's called covering, which means you keep buying more. You're like doubling down. I'm going to keep buying more and keep pushing out that time limit. But eventually you run out of time, right? If people keep buying. So when there's too much shorting, that's what's called a short squeeze. And there's an opportunity for buyers to try to drive that price up, causing the hedge funds to buy more or take that massive loss, which they certainly don't want to do. If anything, they'll buy more to avoid that. And that's really what it got down to. It got down to two sides. The hedge funds, GameStop's terrible, needs to go down in price. Retail investors, like GameStop's good. We used to shop there in the past. Maybe now we love the company. We think video games are the future. Maybe there's other things that are happening and we believe in their story. We believe when there's new things happening, like the founder, one of the founders of Chewy, which is an online retailer pet foods that beat Amazon, that did really well, helps fuel the, the excitement around GameStop. Elon Musk started tweeting some positive things that help drive those prices up. So it's like, Hedge funds, price go down, they win. Retail investors, led by Roaring Kitty, um, you know, and the Wall Street Bets folks, they want the price to go up, and it's that battle between the two. And as part of that is that whole excitement, fear of missing out, and part of that whole movement of it's us versus them, you know, regular folks versus the hedge funds, who's going to win is the narrative. So let's actually take a moment and let's look and see how it played out. I mean, I'm going to show you the numbers. I'm going to show you the stock prices and what kind of happened. Walk through that a little bit. So if we look at GameStop, going back to August 4th, it was a dog, right? It's selling at $4.43 a share. And then it got a little excitement around, a little pickup. A lot of people started getting interested, but it wasn't the craziness yet. On November 3rd, we're looking at $11.57. Not like what it became. Now let's take a look at December and January and what happened here. Okay, so let's go back in time and look at GameStop or GME as its ticker symbol, historical data. 
and we look here at this at December 1st, just going back, look at December, and you can see the price here in this column, this first column is the price. Open high, low, all that kind of stuff is great, but another two numbers to look at is volume, like how much is being traded, and you'll see this number really spike at times, and percentage of change, like how much it went up in one day. So here, December 1st, as an example, the stock was at 1580, and it was down for the day $4.59, or 4.59%, 4 right? Okay, so, but we're still in that 1580 range, right? This is not, you know, hundreds of dollars, right? And you can see that kind of stays the same through December, right? Where we end up December 1st, 31st at about 1884. But you can see there's some spiky days in here. There was an up 25% day, here's a down 19% day, but nothing super crazy unusual. All right, well now let's take a look at January where all the excitement happens, right? This is where it's gonna get start getting crazy. And so if we look at this, January 4th, okay, 17, great. But you can start seeing these prices go, right? They're starting to go up, they're at 19. Now all of a sudden 31, right? Here, January 13th was a big day, up 57%. We had a nice update before that, but 57% in one day. And look at that one volume, volume 144 and a half million shares are traded. Where before, this 14 million is a lot of shares. 5 million is a lot of shares for GameStop. 144 million? That's like Apple. You know, that, that is like a crazy amount of, of trading going on. And the share is, you know, really went up. It went up 57%. So this is where there's other people coming and saying, yes, we believe in GameStop too. Some of the people outside of Wall Street Bets and others. So that starts driving up a 27% day. Then down 11, then up 10, right? So it starts to go up and up and up you know, up to 39, and then it gets crazy. Then it gets to, let's put the squeeze on the Wall Street, uh, on the Wall Street, on the hedge funds. So we're sitting at 39, we go to 43, but then it's like, look at these days, 50, you know, up 51%, up 18%, up 92%, up 134% in one day. We're going from $39 to 43, and green is, means the day's up for the day, $43, $65, $76, $147, 76 to 147, January 26, January 27, $347. If you bought at $17, if you bought at $6, you're making quite a bit of money, right? And this is where all this excitement's happening. Remember this towards the end of January? This is when this was going crazy, right? Right in here, people are jumping in, everybody's buying in, the buy side's getting real high. And then something happened. January 28th happened. It drops from 347, to $193. In fact, the low of the day got down as low as 112, but it drops all the way from 347 down to th uh, to 193, a drop of 44%. And then it picked back up here at 67%. But then after that, we'll, if, we, if we look in February, you would see it would drop down from there, eventually getting down to uh, down into the like the 50s and 40s. It started really dropping uh, from there. In fact, let's take a quick peek at that. If we look at the month of February, there we go, apply that, and we'll change that date. And you can see how on February 1st, it's still at 225, but it starts dropping like a rock, 60s, 50s, 40s, until it starts to come back a little bit, right? So something happens. What happened in January to make that happen, to, to break that momentum? So what happened? You have the hedge funds versus the retail investors. But there's that third player, it's the system, and the system had problems. And we talk about the system, one of the system problems, the big problem was Robinhood, the uh, free online broker where you could buy and sell for free, you know, and how they make their money, goes, the book goes into a little bit of how they make their money by basically processing lots of transactions, selling it to companies like Citadel, who then processed it, and they're all making money along the way. So nothing truly is free. But what happened was with all this buying that was happening, driving the price of all this on the buy side so much, that you that companies like Robin have to, to make it real simple, have to buy in effect insurance payments to cover all these trades. Because it does take an actual behind the scenes a few days, two days, called T plus two, takes a few days for everything to kind of process behind the scenes. You may not see that, you see you buy stock and you get stock, but behind the scenes things have to happen and in order for that to happen, there has to be insurance to make sure it still happens, that there isn't some catastrophe. It's normal business, nothing unusual here. But what was unusual with GameStop price being traded so much and so much heavy on the buy side that basically Robinhood gets a call literally at about five in the morning that says by 10 in the morning in five hours, you have to come up with $3.7 billion raw cash to cover, you know, to cover this from the, the insurance standpoint. And obviously, maybe not obviously, but obviously Robinhood doesn't have that money. I mean, it's just like asking you, hey, come up with, you know, 
whatever, a million dollars. You, you know, who was watching me on the other end, you come up with a million dollars, you got five hours. Well, that's going to be a problem. So you're like, what can you do? Well, Robinhood really had two real tough choices. One, they could shut down their entire system and try to get things balanced out, shut it all down. In fact, if they didn't come up with the money in five hours, the regulators were going to shut them all down. So nobody could trade stocks, whether it was in GameStop, but in any stock, Apple, Tesla, utility companies, Ford, you name it. Nothing's happening. Everything's shut down. So Robinhood doesn't want that to happen. So there's one thing they did do, could do, and they did do, which was you have to adjust that buy side. And how do you adjust it? You shut it down. They shut it down. Nobody could buy GameStop. They shut it down. You couldn't buy GameStop, but you could sell GameStop. You could sell it. You couldn't buy it, but you could sell it. Now, who does that help? That was a big help to the hedge funds. It gave them a chance. It gave them an out. They could get out and sell and not worry about that price getting pushed further so they could get out and start readjusting positions. And meanwhile, the buyers who want to keep driving that price up, drive that up to $500, drive that up to $1,000. You saw how the days were going, right? It was driving up like exponentially. And then it all got a break on it. It got a check on it, basically by Robin Hood. So, and other, and other online brokers too did the same thing because they were facing the same thing. Just Robinhood was the, the big player in this where everybody was trading through on this type of stock. And so the, they had the bigger problem and that became the poster child of that. So Robinhood shuts down the buy side, the sell side's good, hedge funds are taken care of. In addition to what happens is Discord shuts down, which is a, another way that people are communicating about the stock from the retail investor side, but they shut down that communication. And more importantly, um, Reddit, shut down the Wall Street Bets group, at least temporarily, it shut them down so they can communicate either. So not only do you provide um, an advantage to the hedge funds by Robinhood shutting down the ability to buy, but now the main strength of the social network, of the main strength of the retail investor, the regular people, the individuals, the millions of individuals out there, which is their ability to communicate through social networks, through the Reddit forum, is shut down. So you got you heard him twice that way. And there was outrage. Oh my gosh, there was so much outrage. And deservedly so. There was a ton of outrage. And now Congress and government starts to get involved in their outrage. Everybody's outrage. It's like, oh my gosh, again, Wall Street wins, regular people lose, right? And so that's the narrative and that's the story that goes on. So the book talks about that and some of the outrage that was coming and gives it a good, good uh, narrative style and then talks about how then leads to congressional hearings later it became, you know, where the federal government and congressional hearings started pulling all these main players up front from the main hedge fund manager to the guy and head of Citadel, the CEO of Citadel, to one of the CEOs of Robinhood, and of course, Roaring Kitty, the guy who's you know, talking about stocks in his basement. Got to bring him up in front of Congress too. And this leads to something, this is more in my opinion now, where you know, one of the challenges with government, and I'm not an anti-government guy, I'm a little cynical, I will admit that, but one of the challenges of government is they don't understand, our elected leaders don't have this technical knowledge that goes into understanding how, the, let's say, something complex like the financial system works. So they don't know how to really investigate or understand the complexity of the system. Some people in the SEC, the government regulatory agency, might a little bit more, but it, it was, it was, it's interesting when we watch some of these congressional hearings how they don't necessarily know how to ask the right questions in many cases. In fact, that's a challenge we're facing now with like big technology, right? Big tech, Apple, Facebook is a good, another big example of that, where they're looking at them from an antitrust standpoint, from a privacy standpoint, but government, and you have these government hearings, it's hard to really grill Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook when you don't truly understand the, how Facebook works as far as behind the scenes stuff. So. Uh, and then also, so it goes through that and also how some of the big money came back in to kind of bail out Melvin Capital. They say it's not a bailout, but it's an investment. But the Melvin Capital was hurt bad through this, almost went out of business uh, as a big, strong, you know, high-performing hedge fund. But some other big players came in, including Citadel, to kind of help them out. So the book walks through that and really walks through this again in a really good narrative style. Um, uh, I didn't think I would enjoy it as much as I did. I thought I would like it. I thought, okay, I'll play to my geeky side a little bit. And I think it's a very interesting story. I didn't realize how much of an easy read it was too. So if you're geeky stock guys or, and, and women and you like that kind of stuff, you'll get enough of that to make you happy. If you're interested in human drama and story and something that's really fresh in our minds, this is not something that happened you know, 300 years ago. This just happened not too long ago. 
uh, and certainly hear from a human interest story, I think you would enjoy this book too. So uh, I, I didn't like the title, Antisocial Network, but so I'm going to give it 4.5 out of 5. And I said, ah, what the heck, 5 out of 5. I can live with the title. I get the idea. And uh, Ben Mesrick uh, has um, several other books that are very good. One book was made into a movie called The Social Network, which is about the founding of Facebook. And... Uh, um, and so I think they're playing on that. That gets to be more about marketing at that point. So very good book, five out of five. Now let's now let's take a quick look. Is could this happen again? Right. Let's talk about that for just a brief moment. Could it happen again? Should we be looking for these opportunities? And some people are. Some people are looking for like when there's a lot of short interest in a stock, and you can just Google you know short stock, you know high shorted stocks, and you can start finding charts, and you can find things that are showing stocks that are really shorted. You know, the same looking for that same perfect storm where there's so much shorting that puts them at a disadvantage when the retail investors start driving the price up. Could we repeat it? And and so you can maybe find things like that. But the challenge is. And why it may be hard for this to happen again is people know about this. People know about short squeezes. Short squeezes have happened in the short squeezes have happened in the past, but it's a rare thing, more of a generational type thing, or it's not something that gets talked about a lot. Where this was all over the news, even people who were not very interested in the stock market heard about this because it was a massive news story. And certainly, the you know retail investors who are regular investors and the big money, smart money on Wall Street and other firms all over the world, they know all about this. And so they have learned about the power of these social networks, and they're wary, right? They're wary. So what do they do? So first thing they did is these big hedge funds and all that, they hired people, lots of people, teams of people. And what do these people do? All they do is monitor social networking boards, monitoring, monitoring for sure Wall Street bets and others, watching, watching to see if something's going to be a groundswell that might hurt their investment, particularly from a short interest standpoint. And they're also taking smaller bets or smaller chances on shorting. What, how this all occurred was you had people, especially like Melvin Capital, who put big money and big bets on this. Like, how can we lose? GameStop's so terrible. How can, we can't lose until they did, right? So now they take smaller bets, maybe across a lot of different companies instead of big bets on a few companies, or they just reduce their shorting exposure totally. So by doing that, it's hard to have that perfect storm of all this happening again. But people are watching for that. People are trying it. Uh, the terminology, of course, now is meme stocks. If you search for meme stocks, you'll come up with a list of companies that are um, based on their prices are fluctuating, and particularly towards the buy side, not because of the fundamentals or things you might learn in my courses, for example, about price to earnings ratio or dividend yields or even in my technical analysis course looking at charting and momentum theories and moving averages all this stuff that is a great way to learn and invest in the stock market it's all based on that story again what's the story we can tell and can we take advantage of a situation in effect a short that's a stock that's been over shorted so interesting to see if whether this could happen again it may you know but i would say it's going to be much more harder for this to happen now that the to use something maybe Roaring Kitty would like, now that the cat is out of the bag, it's gonna be harder to see this happen again because people are watching for it. But it's a very interesting thing and a very interesting book and a very slice of, of investing life and in life uh, as we know it today. The good news is, as investors, there's ways that we can invest and become successful. Whether you're more of the Warren Buffett, you know, buy great stocks and hold them for other camp, or whether you want to be more of a frequent trader, you know, there are ways for people to be successful through investing. And are there ways for the big money and the hedge fund to maybe make a lot of money and more money than we can? And is it somewhat unfair at times? You bet. You know, there are some unfairness in there, but we can succeed as well. And it doesn't have to be from the perfect storm of a short squeeze or a, you know something that's on Wall Street bets. All right, so with that, that's the, the book review. I hope you enjoyed the book review, something I'm tr I tried here on the channel. I've got a lot of other investing videos here to start checking out, so do subscribe if you find these types of videos and in, in investing videos and stock investing videos interesting. Do subscribe if you like this review, you know, give it a thumbs up and or a like that is. And uh, with that, we'll wrap up for today and uh, look to see you in a, in a future video.